this morning's epistle, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the 12th verse. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed, lest he fall. So far the word of the Lord. To the people of God gathered in Christ Jesus as his church on earth, grace to you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As an intentional interim pastor in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, I'm required to take continuing education classes each year. And additionally, I'm also expected to participate in an annual conference as well as keep in close contact with the district president in the area which I am serving. So starting tomorrow and running through Wednesday, I'll be out at Bethel studying Luther's care for the soul. And not only do I have to do all of this, but I have to receive all my continuing education credits and certificates of participation, and every three years I have to turn them all in to the Interim Ministry Conference of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod for recertification. If I don't, I'm no longer certified for service by the Council of Presidents as an interim pastor in Synod. But you know what, personally, I've been keeping up with continuing education even without this requirement. Because I personally believe pastors should continue to learn and grow and mature in their calling. I mean, stop and think about it. Most professionals and skilled practitioners have to have some type of ongoing education or, or training to be accredited in their field. No one should ever think of themselves knowing everything there is to know in life, right? I mean, there are new discoveries every day. There's a benefit in reviewing the knowledge and the practices that can keep one mentally and physically sharp. I mean, after all, would you go to a certified public accountant who has not kept up with all the changes in the tax codes for the past 20 years? I wouldn't. Or to a doctor who hasn't learned the newest procedures or about the newest medications? Or a lawyer who hasn't cracked a book since law school. No, you want a person who knows their stuff, who continues to sharpen their skills and their knowledge, right? Well, that's part of what Paul is getting at this morning when he's addressing the Corinthians. His admonition to take heed lest you fall is predicated on the challenge to his readers to not act like previous generations of supposed believers. And his argument's very simple. Don't do what they did and suffer the consequences they suffered. So if you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now once again, our chosen epistle reading is taken out of its fuller context, which would help us better understand where Paul is coming from. So I'm going to invite you to join me beginning at verse 1 and following. Paul writes, For I did not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses and in the cloud and the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Let's stop there for a second. Now from the tone of Paul's words, there were those among the Corinthian congregation who may think themselves to be a little bit stronger and a little bit better Christians than they really were. They may have felt that since they had been baptized and regularly partook of the sacrament of Christ's body and blood, that they were now immune to all of the temptations that they might find themselves living among. If you'll recall my first sermon last month, I pictured the decadence and depravity of Corinth. The city was a cesspool when it came to morality. Just like people who get their immunizations each year and don't fear catching whatever pestilence is making the rounds, there were believers in Corinth who felt that once they were baptized, and as long as they showed up to communion ever so often, they would be immune to any danger. Now in Lutheran circles, this thinking is found among those who believe that once they've been baptized and confirmed, I'm good, don't need to come to church except every once in a while for a booster shot. 
And you know, we've all heard it said before, once saved, always saved. Problem is, such thinking is dead wrong. Now, it's obvious to those of us who have and who continue to study the scriptures, coming to worship, attending Bible study, that Paul, in these words, is referencing God's rescue of his people from their Egyptian bondage. For, the, for those of you who are sitting here wondering what Paul's talking about, God rescued his people through his servant Moses. With Pharaoh's army in hot pursuit, the Lord parted the waters of the Red Sea and he held back the Egyptian chariots and soldiers with a pillar of fire while Israel walked across on dry land. Now when he took away the pillar of fire, the Egyptians rushed headlong after the Israelites, but God brought the waters back together, drowning Pharaoh's army. As Israel traveled across the wilderness, God protected them with a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He gave them manna to eat, water to drink that came out of the rocks of the barren desert region. God took care of his people. Unfortunately, many of the Israelites just weren't that faithful toward God. So now we pick up at verse 6. Now, these things took place as examples for us that we may not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of ages has come. Let's stop here. Paul points us to that biblical story that even Gentile believers would know from the Old Testament, which was the only Bible they had at that time. And the apostle points them back to those earlier believers, some who were faithful but especially to those who were not, to show the fallacy of their attitude toward the faith. I mean, faith is a never one and done activity on the part of man. Faith is God's gift to us from his spirit dwelling and working through the means of grace, the word and the sacraments. Being baptized and having been confirmed is only a beginning, never the end for the life of a believer. Those rescued Israelites had seen God bear his arm and work mightily on their behalf. They had seen the cloud. They had watched the waters part. They had tasted the bread of heaven. They had drank the water that God had brought out of the rocks. And they still failed. And they still grumbled. And they turned their backs on their faithful God and worshipped a golden calf of their own creating. And they were destroyed for their lack of faithfulness towards their most trustworthy God. Sinful people thought they could get away with their idolatry and licentiousness, but they didn't. And thus, Paul concludes here. Now, these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction, on whom the end of ages has come. The very same God who rescued his people from their oppressors, who gave them a new land and a new life, is just as real and loving and faithful to us today. Just as Yahweh sent his servant Moses to lead his people to safety, so God the Father sent God the Son Jesus to lead us out from under the oppression of sin, death, and hell through his sacrifice upon the cross. Just as he provided them escape through the parted Red Sea, he now gives us escape from the clutches of the devil, the world, and our own sinful flesh through the waters of baptism. Just as God provided manna from heaven and water from rocks for his people living in a dry and weary land, the Lord comes to us in bread and wine with the very body and blood of Jesus to once again assure us of the forgiveness of our sins and the sure hope of eternal life. All that God did for them, he does for us through that spiritual rock who is Christ. Knowing God's grace and mercy while living in a world of decadence and debauchery, what do we need to be mindful of? Well, Paul closes our reading with this. 
Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape so that you may be able to endure it. It's a difficult at times to match up to the lifestyle that God wants us to live with all these ceremonies and rituals that we make a part of our lives. I can recall parents coming up and thanking me after their child's confirmation. Well, at least they got their ticket punched. Well, those parents relaxed their faithfulness way too soon. Still ahead for those young people were the pressures to make materialism their God, to treat sex as nothing more than an appetite to be satisfied in any way they wanted, the temptation to create their own dream world through drugs and alcohol, and a whole host of temptations that still exist in the world. So I always reminded such parents that all we had done in the confirmation process was lay a foundation that their kids would now have to build on. Paul's concern for his readers is that they need to be careful not to set themselves up for a great fall. He gives us great advice on how to build up our faith foundations. First of all, we need to be realistic about the things that we face on this side of heaven and our ability to resist them. We need to be honest with ourselves that there are a lot of things going on around us that we simply cannot handle all on our own. I mean, even Paul recognized this when he said at the end of the previous chapter, chapter 9, but I discipline my body and keep it under control lest, after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Secondly, Paul tells his readers not to feel exempt from trials because they've checked off all the boxes of a ritualized Christianity. He says, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. I mean, everything you face in life is the same as those who came before as well as those who live with you today. We all have our problems. We all have our burdens to bear. Pain, suffering, misery are all a part of our lives. You're not being punished for some unconfessed transgression. Life on this side of heaven is simply stained and ruined because of sin. But you're not alone in this. That's because, lastly, we have an assurance upon which we can depend. God is faithful. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. God knows us. He knows our strengths. He knows our weaknesses. But he does not leave us to deal with life on our own. No, he comes to us in the means of grace to remind us that we are his and that he takes care of his own. He comes to his church and he calls upon us to gather together and to grow together and then to go out into the community with all the hope and the peace that is ours through Jesus our Savior. So may we continue to gather, to grow, and to go together with a faith that is focused on Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We rise.